We're continuing this morning, uh, Go Ye Therefore, number two, as we talk about the Great Commission. And uh, I want to start in the book of Matthew. And you know what I'm going to read, I bet. And that is the Great Commission itself. In Matthew uh, chapter 28, towards the end, it says, as we start in verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. We are to teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. If we look at verse 19, it says, Go ye therefore and teach. It tells us what it is we're supposed to do. We're to go and teach. But what is it that we are to teach? Because in verse 20 it tells us that, that we teach everything that God has commanded, everything Jesus has taught them that's making disciples. But here he's got another teach in there. What is this teach? And, uh, you know, we'll commonly say, well, he's talking about the gospel, dummy. You're the preacher. You should know that. <laughs> talking about we should be teaching the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? I bet if I were to go around the room right now and ask each one of you, what is the gospel? I'd get a different answer. Similar, but different answer in every one of those. What is the gospel? He says in verse 19, go ye therefore and teach. The gospel, really all through Scripture, even in the Old Testament, all points to really uh, four basic things. Number one, we were created and we are accountable to a mighty God. God created us for a purpose. Each and every one of us, we're not by chance. We're not some random pond, pond scum that evolved over millions of years into a person. Um, there's no accidents that we're here. God created each and every one of us and we are accountable to Him. Secondly, Sin has entered this world. We, you and I, have sinned against God. There's not a person in this world that has not sinned against God. Thirdly, God has made a way for that sin, that separation that occurs because of our sin, for us to be reconciled. And there's only one way that that reconciliation is going to take place, and that is through what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. And we take hold of that salvation by repentance of our sin and faith in Jesus Christ. You see, that's the gospel message. And we could say it in different ways, but these four things hold true of what the gospel is. Number one, again, we are accountable and cre we are created by God and accountable to Him. There's going to be a judgment one day for everyone. And that's not something to fear if we understand what Scripture is and the promises that are told. Everyone has been created by God and will be accountable to Him. Number two, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and our sin causes separation between us and God. Number three, God has made a way for this separation again to be reconciled, and that is through Jesus Christ dying on the cross and defeating death three days later. And number four, we take hold of that salvation by repentance of our sin. That means a changed behavior, by the way. Not only acknowledging our sin, but changing the behavior thereof through the power of the Holy Spirit and having faith in Jesus Christ. You know, last week we talked about, um, as I started this, Go Ye Therefore, uh, the title of the sermon was Help Wanted. And uh, we see that there's this particular place in Scripture that shows us as Jesus is going through His day that He does all of these different things in the ministry from healing here to casting out devils to, to teaching and preaching, all of these things. And it says He turns around and He looked out and He just saw the multitudes. And who is the multitude? It's all of us, both Christian and non-Christian. He saw the multitude and when He looked out at the multitude He had compassion. He had compassion, if you remember, because he said they're as sheep with no shepherd. And then he made a call. He says that the, the harvest is ready. It's many, but the laborers are few. And he said, pray for more laborers to come for the harvest. This week I want us to continue the theme of Go Ye Therefore. And if you would, turn with me to the book of Corinthians. 
going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to start at verse 18, and I ask you to stand with me, if you would, as we read. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse number 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the, Gru the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not men, many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and these things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. That no flesh should glory in His presence, but of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who is God, is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you now, and I just thank you, God, for this time we've been able to freely come and assemble together in your precious Son, Jesus' name. And God, I just ask that there be power in the gospel message that is proclaimed today. Your words, Lord, as they are read and as they are expanded upon, may your power, the power of your Spirit, be in them. And God, would you just move each and every one of us wherever we need to go in whatever direction, Lord. If we are good and faithful servants, may we become stronger and more mature. And God, if, if we are convicted by the word that is spoken to us today, then may that conviction prick us straight to the heart, Lord, and may we respond by getting closer to you. And God, if there is one or many here or listening abroad that just does not understand your saving grace, that does not understand the relationship you have created, then God, we ask through the power of your Spirit when they hear these words today, your words, God, not mine, that they be convicted and that they receive, Lord, they reach out for the salvation of your grace through belief in your Son, Jesus. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So we see Paul speaking to the church of Corinth, and it's a correction letter. All through Corinthians we see great, great... Um, Great lessons, but the purpose behind those lessons as he was going to the church in Corinth was about trying to correct some things that were going on there. And we see that he starts off with this letter, and, and I just want to read to you again verse 18, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. He says this, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. I want you to really think about that verse for a second. As he says here, that the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness. Really, what he's saying here is those that are perishing, those that are constantly falling further and further away from God, those who are separated by their sin and have no reconciliation whatsoever to God, he says the preaching of the cross to those individuals is plain out foolishness. They just don't get it. They don't understand. And so they continue further and further in their parish. And then he goes on in saying this, But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. You see, it's by God's power that we have the right of salvation at all. It is by God's power, His love, His mercy for us, but His power that allowed Jesus Christ to come to this earth, to live as a man, to teach us, to die on the cross, and three days later to defeat death by being raised from the dead. You see, that's the power of God. 
And it is through that action that we celebrate at Easter as much as we might have kids running after Easter eggs and we might have people jumping around in bunnies. There's going to be all kinds of bunnies sold come up this weekend. And then they're going to be cooked two months from now. <laughs> might not need to put that one in the recording. But <laughs> Easter is about God's loving grace to mankind. That he created each one of us. Again, the basic gospel message. He created each one of us and we are accountable to him. And because of our sin, that sin has separated us from God. You see, this is preaching the cross. That sin that has separated us from God, the only way we can be in reconciled with God is through the mercy and what Jesus, or what God did through Jesus dying on the cross. So Paul to the church of Corinth says, preaching of the cross to us which are saved, it is the power of God. The atoning sacrifice of our sin. Jesus died. You know, if we were to look all through the Old Testament, all through the Old Testament from the time that Eve sinned and brought sin into the world, and, and uh, we could have the debate whether it was really Eve that sinned first or was it Adam's fault and all of that. The truth is mankind sinned. And sin has been in the world. And ever since then, death is a result of sin. And so all through the Old Testament, we are told, we are taught, we are foretold, we are prophesied to an understanding that sin equals death. All sin equals death. And God, in His infinite mercy, put a plan in place that cannot be replicated in any other way to an understanding that sin will always cause death. But blood will save us from that death. And all in the Old Testament we see sacrificial things happening, all pointing to Jesus Christ coming one day. Sacrificial things such as in the Old Testament of Him saying, for a sin offering you find a lamb without blemish. And that there was this whole process of taking this perfect animal and killing the animal and sprinkling the blood of that animal and it being sacrificed for the sins of the people. You see, really what was happening was a transfer of sin from the people to the animal. All pointing to the New Testament that we see, a preaching of the cross. That the ultimate, the last sacrifice that would ever have to be made for our sin would be the perfect sacrifice Jesus. I'm going to turn back in the book of John, John 3, and I'm going to start at verse 14. And it says this, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Even before he took the cross, many times Jesus told his disciples, this is Jesus speaking, he told the people around him what was going to happen to him, and they just didn't understand. So he says, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whatsoever, or excuse me, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the one or the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. When we see light here, light is talking about the truth. The truth is that godly wisdom that Paul is talking about to the church of Corinth. Not truth in the way man perceives it or wants to make it by philosophy, but the truth that God has given through Jesus Christ. You know, if we want a further understanding, there's so many verses, but I, I've just been led to read to you out of the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. To the Christian it says this, There is therefore now no condemnation 
to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. How? For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Again, there's no condemnation for those who are after Christ Jesus. We've been reconciled, washed and returned to right standing with God through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And so Paul says, preaching of the cross to some that are perishing is foolishness. But to us which are saved, it is the power of God. You know, I want to turn back to 1 Corinthians he goes on as we continue reading, starting at verse number 19. It says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, that the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. You know the foolishness that Paul is talking about here. If you think about Jesus, Jesus came into this world. He was poor. As he started growing up, he became homeless. He went through things in a very humble spirit, and it caused all kinds of confusion. For the Greeks, all they thought was knowledge was the end of everything. Knowledge to be the most knowledgeable was to be the elite. It all had to do with human reasoning. What can man understand and predict? But to the Jews it was different. The Jews had a relationship with God, and they had been prophesied that a Messiah one day was going to come. And so they've been waiting for that Messiah. And when they see that Jesus is that Messiah, they're thinking, could this really be the Messiah? But then they say, there's no way. It's a stumbling block for them. Why? Because they expected a king to come rolling in. They expected a king to come triumphant, come to return them to their rightful place, to overthrow the Romans and anyone else, to come in under strict power. And they just couldn't understand that here's Jesus, this humble man without a home, teaching love and peace and not coming in and taken over. Again, to the Greeks, they just considered it foolishness that here's a man preaching all of this love and understanding in God when they know they're much smarter than to take something as a simple understanding that God, one God, created all men and to be in a relationship with Him. The whole understanding that man has sinned, their thought process, well, man doesn't sin. We're smart enough to know right from wrong in our own eyes. Scripture always tells us that man did what they thought was right in their own eyes. They couldn't understand the thought of if this guy really is king, if he is God in the flesh, why couldn't he save himself on the cross? You see, it's just plain foolishness. But Paul reminds the church in Corinth, we preach the cross, Jesus Christ crucified. To the Jew it is a stumbling block, and to the Greek it is foolishness. We go on, if you'll read verse 23 with me. He says, But we as Christians, we preach Christ crucified, and to the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. And then he goes on in verse 24 as he speaks of the power of God, not the power of man. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. True power and true wisdom. He goes on starting at verse number 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than men. You see, most people don't understand the true power of God. They think of only the power in themselves. You know, uh, I commonly hear people say, you really can't rely on people. You really can't rely on anything else. You only get somewhere in this world by the decisions you make and what you decide to do on your own. And I will tell you under that philosophy, you're going to fail. 
and you're going to fail miserably. Surely, it may be right to say that uh, man's going to fail you because man and woman will fail you. We are people. I will fail you if I haven't yet. Just wait. It'll happen. I won't mean to, but as your pastor somewhere, I will fail you because I'm a man. But there's one that will never fail us, and that is God Almighty through His Son, Jesus Christ. But when we decide that we're going to put everything in our own hands, that is a major failure getting ready to happen. God will teach us lessons and show us that really we're in charge of nothing. He goes on in verse 26, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, human wisdom, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Those in positions of authority and those things that really get puffed up about themselves. He goes on in verse 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. That no flesh should glory in His presence. You see, it's not about us, our achievements, and our glory. God's ways are not our ways, saith the Lord. And God uses ways that this world doesn't identify, doesn't understand to accomplish His power and His glory. He goes on again in this verse 29 that no flesh should glory in His presence. We can't be puffed up and proud. But in Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto... And I want you to look at these four words. Through Christ we have wisdom. You see, preaching of the cross is wisdom. And through that wisdom, we have righteousness. In following the wisdom of the Bible, when it comes to the cross, it brings to us righteous standing. And sanctification. We are sanctified through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And when we understand that wisdom and we start to walk in a righteous life and we're sanctified by Jesus' blood on the cross, the last one it says is redemption. We are redeemed. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. There's one way we get to glory, and that's in God Almighty, not self-glory. So Paul, he talks to the church and he's on this mission of go ye therefore. Paul has been a changed man by an interception with Christ himself. The Holy Spirit is working in Paul because Paul is allowing the Holy Spirit to work inside of him. And he's preaching the cross. You know, just before this, what I didn't talk about in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, there's a dispute that's going on in the church. And the dispute is the church that has been founded and now it is growing. Here's the dispute that's happening. So there's different individuals inside of the church that are taking a leadership role. And they begin to have followers, people that they have led to Christ. But now the people are getting confused. It's not all about Christ, but they're getting centered on the person that led them to Christ. And so some would say, I've been baptized by Chloe, or I've been baptized by this person, as if it's something different. And Paul's saying, I don't care who baptized you. It's all about Jesus Christ, not about people. And so he starts off where we are in verse 18 again. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish, those that are perishing foolishness, but to those of us who are saved. It is the power of God. You know, <coughs> constantly I'm asked, how, how do I, how do I start a conversation with someone about the Lord? I'm just not good at that. I'm shy. I'm scared. You know, the truth is we all hate rejection. How is it I do this? And you know, the truth is we'll all come up with all kinds of excuses. I've heard them. I've made them up myself of why we are scared to talk to somebody about Christ. Well, I don't know everything. Well, you know what? Neither do I. There's a lot we don't know until we get to heaven with the Father. We will not be perfect until then. 
But how is it I do this? Understand, Paul is saying, stick to the simple message. The simple message of the cross. The Great Commission where it says, Go ye therefore and teach. It's understanding these four basic principles that I started with. Number one, God created everyone with purpose. And we are accountable to our Creator. Number two, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're accountable for that sin. But our sin falls short of the glory of God. And so God, in His love and in His mercy for us, has made a way for this separation because of our sin to be reconciled. And there's only one way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. There is no other way to the Father except by me. What Jesus Christ did on the cross, dying for my sins and your sins, reconciling us to the Lord and defeating death because of sin. And all we have to do, the fourth and basic thing, is take hold of that salvation by understanding our sin, repenting of our sin, and putting our faith in Jesus Christ. You see, that's how we witness. That's the basic message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not that hard, is it? And you know what? We don't need to be concerned whether someone receives the message or not. We don't need to be concerned whether they say, I, I don't want to hear that. If that's the case, say, I'm sorry for interrupting you. I'm praying for you and be on your way. But you know, very few times in this life have I been told when I ask someone, can I pray with you? Have they said no? Very few times in this life when I ask someone, can I tell you about Jesus Christ, the saving power of Jesus Christ, very few times have I been told no. It has happened, but a whole lot more people have allowed me to share. They've allowed me to share. Now, it's not about whether I share fancy with fancy words. If you know me, you know I don't have fancy words. I got my own language I make up. It's called Belotherin. It's just about the simple message. Paul says, we preach the cross. We're sinners, and our only way of reconciliation is understanding what Jesus did and having faith in Him. I don't know where you are as I look out. I know presently we have many believers, and I don't know who's going to be listening abroad as, as this goes wherever it is. But you, you can be saved if you're not by simply understanding God has created all of us with purpose, and we're all accountable to Him. With a simple understanding that we're sinners, and that sin separates us from God, but we can be reconciled by what God has done. And we celebrate on Easter that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And that all we have to do to receive that salvation is to repent of our sins and to have faith in the saving grace of God through what Jesus Christ has done. I'm going to ask you a present as, as we close, as our praise team comes forward and plays. If you don't truly know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, why would you go another day without Him? If you're listening abroad and that's the case, you can change this right now by just acknowledging. If God has laid upon your heart something uh, just about witnessing or going, I don't know what it is, or whatever troubles or joys there may be in your life, but if God has laid something on your heart, that's the Holy Spirit. And I just ask you, don't, don't shut it down. Don't shut down the Holy Spirit. Respond today as we stand, as we close together. Thank you.